Next up, I promised you we'd be learning more about Lockwood. Um, obviously, it's sponsors of this Mapping the Metaverse. And next up is our superstar session. And it's Oliver Kern coming up, friend of the show. And uh, Oliver's going to be talking about the Metaverse being mobile. Hi, Oliver. Hey, Sophia. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. I'm uh, over here in Amsterdam and uh, the weather is okay. <laughs> it looks so, yeah, it looks sunny. You've got a bit of a shine. It's nice. I mean, yeah, exactly. it's sort of sunny now, but uh, as I thought in the middle of that talk, we did have a massive uh, downpour. So the weather is unpredictable as always. But hopefully so that's probably I'm... coming here in half an hour then. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, it's great to have you here. While you get yourself all set up, I'm just going to remind everyone, throw the questions into the Q&A like you were during the last chat, and I'll come back at the end and myself and Oliver will go through some of the questions and answers for everyone. So uh, hello, everyone. Um, I hope you're having a great conference so far. Um, this is day one. Lots and lots and lots of content to come. Um, this track is about mapping the metaverse. So I thought we can kind of kick off this session. Um, with a little bit of a definition of the metaverse. Um, so I'm going to share like a quote that I that I find and I found, and I thought it was actually quite a, quite a good one. There will probably be lots more talks with also different definitions, and hopefully lots of other very intelligent people that will take a stab at uh, what actually the metaverse is or what it is to become. Um, so here's mine. Um, Nikki Shum from uh, Subspace. It's like a company that is providing a faster network for real-time applications. So she wrote in VentureBeat, a virtual reality-based successor of the internet filled with real-world metaphors and rampant opportunities for digitized entertainment, social bonding, and enterprise. Um, I thought that was really, really a great um, quote and definition. And I wanted to kind of call out three things that I felt are really, really important. Because for me, it's not necessarily about how you kind of access this uh, metaverse. Is it through VR or through console or are games kind of the gatekeeper of that? It's more like what it actually is. Um, so one of the things for sure is like a metaverse needs to have these real world metaphors. It needs to somehow be grounded in kind of um, the real world. Um, that's for sure one of the aspects that I found really quite fascinating. Otherwise, probably people would start arguing that, you know, the MMOs from 20 years ago that are still alive and kicking are also kind of the metaverse. Um, so there, there is definitely potential for a discussion here. Then it's about uh, digitized entertainment. I think that's also really, really important. If you're kind of a successor of the internet, um, entertainment is really an important part of that and how that could look. And then lastly, um, it's around social bonding. Um, very, very important. I think the metaverse is not a single player experience. If we take like Ready Player One, um, as an example there, it's also you and others. So I think the social bonding aspect is really, really important um, to, to kind of um, have something that is a metaverse. So um, at Lockwood Publishing, we've basically been building unreal places, um, like 3D virtual worlds uh, for people. Um, we have an app called Avakin Life. It has about three, well, more than 3 million downloads every month. And we have about 1.2 million players play it every day. Um, it is very, very social. Um, people recommend it to their friend. We also have like a good star rating and it is on mobile. And that's obviously also kind of the, what my talk is about and why we at Lockwood think that mobile is really like a very, very important factor for kind of the metaverse and for access to the metaverse. Um, yeah, so to give like a little bit more background about Avakin Life, um, you basically create an avatar um, that is as unique as you. So with lots of different um, things that you can choose from tattoos to obviously hairstyles, uh, head shapes, clothes, and all these kind of things. So we have more than 26,000 um, items that allow you to really kind of style the avatar that you want to be. Um, 
And, you know, there are real world brands included in there. It's not only just some random things. You can get some Nike sneakers if you want to. And we also have like regular fashion events and competitions. And um, yeah, it allows you also to really experiment with yourself. Um, try to be somebody who you always wanted to be or try to be somebody different to uh, who you are. Um, and I think that is has always been like the fascination of, um, you know, creating an avatar and being either a version of yourself or actually experimenting with it and trying to be somebody completely different. And we've been around for quite a while. And for us, I mean, now the metaverse is like a hot topic maybe, but for those that are kind of, I would say the gatekeepers for them, um, the metaverse has always been a hot topic. It has always been something that is super, super relevant. Um, and for us, we've had like um, our first steps, you know, we launched in end of 2013 and it was like, you know, it took a, took a little bit to kind of get up to speed, but um, you know, it was already then like here, as you can see in some of the examples, like in 2016, when we had like music events uh, starting to appear inside um, our app, um, and it was always for us to, to really create this thriving virtual world, um, something new to explore every day you come in that you can either explore on your own and just see other people also do that together with your friends. Um, and a lot of our, our players are actually doing that. They either meet people in there that become friends or bring in their friends and basically hang out to, together with them. And we do try to kind of pick up the trends of the of all the various corners of the world. So we do pick up pop culture, things that are happening in the world, et cetera, and basically bring that also to, to um, Avakin Life. We want to provide our users really this alternate world that is that allows them to kind of fulfill some of their aspirations, desires, that definitely stands also for their values. Um, but very importantly, it's also a space that really fosters uh, socialization, makes it easy really to connect with, uh, with other people. And we've also been always quite active when it comes to kind of digital entertainment. So we've had uh, like bands come into, into the game also already starting like in 2016 with like a super small indie band. Um, and um, back then, and um, you know, had had then way before the pandemic actually started, um, you know, started working with uh, the bigger labels um, like Warner or Universal Music, etc., um, and bring kind of real world um, artists into our game. So here, as an example, we've had uh, Haley Kyoko um, play in uh, inside Avakin in October 2019 already. That was like half a year before the pandemic really hit. Um, obviously, once that happened, it, it definitely did open a lot of doors. Actually, the, the first show um, that Epic had in Fortnite already kind of created some awareness within the music industry and people suddenly started thinking about like, okay, actually there is another avenue to kind of users and not only like a few, a few thousand or with a big festival, I don't know, a few tens of thousands, but actually accessing millions of people. Um, we, we started doing like a, an annual festival. So we have like also the Saula Sound Festival uh, this year. Um, and, you know, with year over year, these kind of things get uh, bigger and better with, uh, with more interesting bands uh, joining with sponsors and all these kind of things, like a real world thing. Um, but you know, it hasn't only been music. We've also worked with uh, fashion artists, uh, fashion designers, and um, um, tried, especially during the pandemic, to kind of give them also like a a, a space to kind of showcase um, showcase fashion. So um, here is. Um, something that we've just uh, launched recently, which is basically um, a show inside the app. So whereas um, 
usually you will uh, link out from uh, from an app to like another destination, let's say YouTube or something like that. Um, we've actually uh, created like a, a virtual cinema, so our users can actually go into that cinema and uh, watch content. So not only like typical games where you always have to do something and do this or that, you can actually also just sit back and, and relax. So um, uh, that has been super, super successful. Um, our players have loved it. Um, and we're obviously looking for kind of, there are, there are lots of other opportunities around just, uh, you know, being able to show uh, video content within um, an app. So obviously from the pandemic, watch, watch parties started to suddenly become a thing. Um, and we've, we've kind of um, released our version inside, inside the app. Um, but what I wanted to kind of um, really go through is why we believe that the metaverse actually needs to be mobile. And I'm really sorry for, for all the fanboys of um, Ready Player One and, and the author as well. Um, you know, the, the, their vision in, in the book um, around it being like a, a true, fully immersive VR experience, um, you know, definitely has, has its limitations. Um, and um, here are a couple of reasons why. So, you know, mobile is what actually really rules, um, rules the world. So uh, Statista gave out some, some data for this year, they expect like 3.8 billion active smartphones. Um, and that is obviously um, growing uh, year over year. Um, more and more people are like putting their, their very old chip phone generation away um, uh, moving to smartphones and people that are using smartphones also kind of really upgrading every every few years um, the the generation smartphone that they that they have um, so why why is this this kind of so relevant um, it is relevant because really um, mobile has kind of changed the way that we experience the internet so, you know, whereas 10 years ago, it was, you know, always about um, accessing everything on the internet via your, or your PC and laptop. Um, today, actually, most of the, the web traffic uh, happens from mobile. Our users, when they create content, um, and you can imagine some of them, you know, do like quite sophisticated stuff. They do everything on their mobile phone. They have different apps for different things for kind of cutting content, for doing like little effects, et cetera. But everything for them happens actually on their smartphone. Um, um, and also emerging markets have, have basically really made the jump immediately, not through PC, but actually immediately to, to kind of mobile. Um, so for, for, um, for today's generation Z or generation alpha, you know, everything that is relevant to them actually happens, happens on the mobile phone. Um, it's purchasing that happens on mobile devices more and more and is growing. It's kind of uh, the transaction value that is growing. So it means also more um, costly and not just impulse uh, purchases are also happening via the mobile phone. Uh, mobile has actually been the fuel for a kind of growth of social. Um, today, like 99% of social media browsing is actually happening uh, on smartphone. I mean, I never kind of go watch uh, TikToks on, on, uh, on uh, my, my laptop. Um, everything really happens there on, on, um, on your phone. Um, it's where the users are and where they also spend a lot of their time because obviously as kind of social creatures that we are, it's really, um, you know, the, the mobile phone is like that important device uh, to kind of have that connection, that um, addiction also to kind of get uh, validation, um, get likes or responses from people, all these kind of things that all, all that happens really on, on your phone and people are always accessible uh, through their mobile phone. So if the metaverse, while it's coming, is really has to cater for our need for social bonding, um, then really the device of choice 
um, um, to kind of uh, do that is really um, the, the mobile phone. And that's why, uh, you know, that's where our focus also as a company is. For us, um, you know, access to the metaverse is uh, if it wants to be very inclusive, wants to, um, you know, get everybody on board and be something for the whole world, then it actually needs to happen on, on mobile. Um, so just to kind of recap a little bit, um, you know, for me, metaverse, it's, you know, the discussion there shouldn't really be about like, what is, what is the path there? Um, it shouldn't be about like, oh, does it all have to be uh, with VR goggles and, and that kind of very immersive uh, virtual reality? It should also not be the discussion about um, NFTs and ownership and these kind of things. It's really about the, the, the core principles of the, of the, of the metaverse. Um, and for me, that has to be that there has, have to be these kind of real world metaphors. It is about entertainment um, and very, very important. It is about social bonding. And that's also why I think like, you know, games are a very, very good gateway for the metaverse because, um, you know, game companies um, have understood like the, the power of kind of social communities or communities around their games. And if their, if their games and applications kind of nurture that, um, allow enough uh, uh, communication and socializing, then there is really a, a, a strong case for um, that app or game being part of the metaverse. Um, it should really be something that is inclusive, that is accessible for anybody. Um, and that's why we believe actually that this should happen predominantly on mobile. Yeah, and um, that brings me to the end. Um, I hope we have still have some time for kind of questions. Um, yeah, thank you, Oliver. No, we definitely do have some time for questions. So I wanted to remind everyone, we've got one at the moment, but please do throw your questions into the Q&A because we'll go through them. But the first one is from Sarah. And Sarah asks, um, what sets Avakin apart from other avatar-based games such as IMVU or Second Life? Um, that's a good question. So um, we started, uh, mobile first, I think that is that is definitely like a big difference. If you look at the IMVU or Second Life, uh, both of them started much more on the PC, and um, the experience then also for the users is um, is best on a PC. Um, yeah. We're we're kind of we started really mobile first. Uh, we went heads on. Uh, uh, into that and in 2013 when kind of real-time multiplayer <laughs> was really a scary thing um, that's when we kind of um, started this this whole process so I think that's kind of the biggest the biggest difference um, there are some some similarities um, some big differences um, I think in comparison to IMVU Avakin is um, I, I would say because it's not 18 plus, it's uh, you know definitely more uh, safe, uh, a safer place. I would say, and um, yeah. you know we really put a lot of effort into kind of um, you know keeping a very friendly and inclusive community there. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that's important to have options so that you have different areas for different kinds of people and different sort of you know ages of people as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, I'm going to do the um, the second question here first, just because it's continued to, to Avakin before we move on to the others, because we've got more than enough time. Uh, so someone's asked, how do you see Avakin life five years from now? Um, well, that's an interesting, <laughs> good question. Uh, I think, well, we, we, we have started working a lot towards um, making sure that the app is kind of um, culturally, culturally relevant in the different play, parts of the world, um, which means that the experience in Brazil, for example, is slightly different than the experience in Saudi Arabia. Um, and, you know, especially when it's kind of avatar based and has this real world um, simulation, it needs to kind of pick up things that are 
familiar for yourself, right? So if you're in uh, Singapore, you need to kind of come in there and feel there are some things that you can relate to, as well as if you're from, I don't know, San Francisco or, or somewhere in Argentina, right? So that is definitely um, um, something that we're, we're working a lot towards. So to kind of cater even more to the, to the different experiences. The other thing that is um, really, really important for us, and I think Roblox shows a good case for that, is to kind of really make sure that also the users in some way or other can basically um, also participate in creating content, in, in creating this world. I think that is um, definitely something that also for us at, uh, at Lockwood is very high up in the agenda. Great, yeah. Um, so there might be more African questions later on, but you know, to make sure we get a balance. Um, the next question, which was one of the first that came in is, uh, do you see so social interactions being almost fully based in digital environments in the future, especially given COVID? Well, I, I don't think um, that it's going to be entirely that. I mean, take game conferences as an example. Um, you know, we can do great things here. And I, I think the, the team at Steel Media is doing a fantastic job kind of putting these conferences together. It still kind of misses this, um, you know, I bumped into this or that person and we had like an interesting conversation because that's something that, uh, you know, digital can only do to a, to a degree. Now, in a virtual world, there is more, um, uh, you know, there is maybe more opportunity there, but it still, you know, feels a little bit uh, more artificial. I, I would always argue that like a virtual world allows you to kind of experiment with socialization. You know, if you're maybe not very extrovert, it gives you like a, a, a place to kind of experiment with that. Whereas in the real world, you know, if that doesn't go well, you're basically sad for a week or whatever. Um, yeah. So I, I do think that, um, you know, it, 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 it offers a lot of opportunity, but it's not going to do everything. No, for sure yeah. not. Yeah, um, and James has asked, um, you may, he says, um, I'll read it out with word, you make a good point on accessing the metaverse from mobile so that it is open to everyone. But do you think it will evolve so we move to a Ready Player One scenario? Um, I, th I think there will be more and more ex experiences. I think um, the, the kind of that kind of uh, very immersive uh, VR experience is lacking like the killer application. Um, I, I, I think that's that's where where the challenge really lies. Um, if once that is there and people are willing to spend like six hours, eight hours, whatever, how much time, in, in that kind of um, sh shut off kind of environment. Um, yeah, then I think it has a, has a big chance, but until then, I think it's really, really hard. Um, and I don't know what that application would be, but you know, who, who would have thought that mobiles are something that you check, I don't know, 50 times an hour or whatever, um, like 10 years ago. So I, I think, you know, yeah, I think it can absolutely happen, but I think that's, that's what is needed. It needs really those kind of killer applications where you cannot um, do it else, elsewhere and in a different way and you really need to, need to be there. Um, otherwise, I think it's gonna be always gonna stay a bit of a niche. It will still have, be a great experience, um, but you know, I, I think that's where it can become quite challenging. Yeah, yeah. kind of mass adoption, yeah. Yeah, and we're getting questions coming in, so I'm going to try and fit as many in as we can, and then we'll um, maybe we'll have to take it to the Discord or something. Yeah. But um, uh, so next one we've got is: uh, Do you foresee um, issues with backwards compatibility? This can often affect mobile products. How would this accessibility to the metaverse be affected by this? Yeah, it's a challenge. I mean, we're also we're also kind of um, experiencing that challenge. Obviously, I mean, we try to be like low end compatible for low end devices, so to say, right? Because we are trying to be like an application for everyone, and not only like the latest high end devices. Um, so, uh, but it is really, really challenging. It costs a lot of effort to kind of maintain access on like Android 
I don't know, I don't know what we're currently supporting as lowest, but let's say Android 2.6 or something like that. Probably we're a bit beyond that now, but um, it's, it's really, really challenging. But uh, what we are experiencing is that also, you know, if, you, if you're kind of um, mobile phones are kind of evolving, you know, if you give it enough time and you're not saying it's only available on the, on the highest end, um, I think then we can we can kind of take large chunks of the of the world with us. Yeah. Yeah. And um, next, we've got Sarah's asked, um, how do you see the metaverse affecting gaming culture in non-immersive slash not VR games? Um, I'm not sure. I I fully understand the question. I I do think I, that I, I think that. If, if, Sorry. Oh, sorry, I was just gonna say, I think if I interpret it rightly, it's, you know, do you think that metaverses will have an effect on, for example, single player experiences, those sorts of things will have a knock on effect on, on games that aren't directly connected to metaverse worlds? I think, you know, single player experiences um, are, are great. Um, and and they, they, will, they will never cease to exist. Um, what is clear is that, you know, uh, for any game, even be it single player, if there is a big enough community, that's kind of what makes it really exciting. And that's what kind of um, also is, is exciting for the game developer at the end of the day to say like, hey, you know, all these people love this. And, you know, you then tr start thinking about like, how do we actually, you know, can we provide them a service and these kind of things. Now, if you, if you kind of make sure that they also talk with each other and, and you kind of create that, that aspect, I think then, then, it's, then it's really, really cool. So I do could imagine that, you know, single player games with, with a, let's say a Discord layer or whatever on top where you can still kind of chat with your friends um, in, in that sense, um, you know, things like that, I think will, will, probably pop into single player games over over time yeah um and i'll fit one last question in um and so chris chris james has asked um you focused on mobile phone technology and obviously we're all very vested in this especially here at steel media but do you think there'll be a further technical leap at any point soon for example uh, will we all look at phones as being a relic when we're wearing VR headsets or Google glasses in five years time? I mean, I know it's a continual question that seems to have been lingering for about a decade now, but uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I do, th I, I do think that, um, you know, the big tech companies are working on making those kind of glasses more accessible, so to say. And I think once that is there, then actually, so I'm not, I'm more of a believer in, in like AR kind of experiences than like those fully closed off kind of immersive VR experiences. I think there we're definitely going to see, um, you know, some technology jumps. Um, and, but it's then also not like a predominant games thing. I, I mean, AR and games, yes, there have been lots of experiences and experiments with that, but it's to be seen what, what as a games industry we kind of make of that. I'm, will be interesting. Um, yeah. Could be cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know there's a lot more questions. It's been a very, very popular talk. So thank you for that. But unfortunately, we've come to time now. So I don't know if you're going to be in the Discord or any, or if there's any way people can reach you if they've got some pressing questions or anything. Um, yeah. The, the easiest to reach me is actually on LinkedIn. Perfect. Um, yeah. There you go. So yeah, if you have some burning questions, go find Oliver on LinkedIn. Okay. and uh, continue the chat but thank you so much oliver for being our superstar session and uh, yeah really popular talk thank you for everything thank you sophia thanks everyone thank you bye, -bye. thanks <laughs>